together with him and made to sit together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Is the 
Jesus, King of angels. Blessed Prince of Peace. Revealing things of heaven. All its mysteries. Spirits ever in which to stand This is King of glory Son of God and Son of Man His name is Jesus Precious Jesus Lord Almighty
offices to me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You have 
we want to also thank you for your ongoing faithfulness in giving. You can actually give in three different ways. Simply go to the description portion of this video on YouTube and click on the giving link. This will take you to our website. From there, you can give securely through PayPal. There is no account required. Or you can also download the Givelify app, find Living Faith Church, Exelon, Wisconsin, or simply mail a check or money order to Living Faith Church, P.O. Box 65, Exelon, Wisconsin, 54835. Please remember to pray for our nation and our leaders, along with our LFC missions families in Tanzania, Africa, India, Mexico, and Honduras. Thanks, everyone. And Father, we declare and believe that this morning, as your word goes forth, that it will not return void, but it will prosper in what you please. It will accomplish the thing you sent it to do. And we thank you that it will bear much fruit in the lives of your people in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. This morning we're looking at, are you living with a slave mentality? And we're going to choose for our text here, Hebrews chapter 3. If you'd open your Bibles with me, you can follow along on your sheet or follow along up here as well. Um, you know, even though I, we hand out sheets, and I know that makes it easy for you, and, uh, but make sure you bring your Bibles to church, amen, and check the things that I'm saying, making sure they're right. But Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, and uh, through 19, I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation, and then we're going to read uh, one passage of uh, Hebrews 4 as well. It says that that is why the Holy Spirit says... Today, you must listen to his voice. Don't harden your hearts against him as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested God's patience in the wilderness. There your ancestors tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them, and I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I made a vow. <clears throat> they will never enter my place of rest. Be careful then, dear friends, <clears throat> excuse me, be careful then, dear friends, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in what all that belongs to Christ. But never forget the warning. Today you must listen to his voice. Don't harden your hearts against him as Israel did when they rebelled. And who were those people who rebelled against God even though they had heard his voice? Weren't they the ones Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he vowed that they would never enter his place of rest? He was speaking to those who disobeyed him. So we see that they were not allowed to enter his rest because of their unbelief. So let's read chapter 4 here down into verse 2. God's promise of entering his place of rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fall, fail to get there. For this good news that God has prepared a place of rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did not profit them or did, did them no good because they didn't believe what God had told them. The word says here in verse 2 out of the King James, the New King James, it's for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. So we know that we can hear the word of God, but the word of God's not going to profit us if we do not act upon the word of God. It's not the hearers of the word that are justified, it's the doers of the word that are justified. The power of God is in his word. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus spoke from a physical body, but he said the words that he spoke were power, they were full of life. Jesus said to the fig tree, be no man eat fruit from you forever, and it died. He cursed the fig tree, and it died. And Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this mountain, be plucked up and cast into the sea, and it would obey you. So there is power in spoken words because we release authority. But our message isn't about that this morning as much as it is about liberty. You know, this generation that came out of Egypt with Moses, and we speak about these guys a lot, this generation, but the Bible tells us that these things are written down for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. 
So the, these, these stories, these accounts in Scripture, they're given to us so that we can learn from their examples. And we learn by people's failures. We learn by people's successes. But as we look at people and their failures, we look and say, you know, and the, the writer to Hebrews here gives us a dire warning. Don't fall prey to their example. Don't fall prey to their unbelief. Don't let there be in you an evil heart of unbelief in turning from the living God. And of course, contextually, he was speaking to these Hebrew Christians because they were actually considering abandoning their faith in Yeshua as Messiah and turning back uh, under, uh, trying to become righteous under Torah. And that's what this entire letter is about, that the old way of the Levitical priesthood was passing away, making way for a new and living way through the blood and veil of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, but if we think of that generation that was in Egypt, God prophesied to Abraham and said, your descendants will go into a land they do not know and they will journey there, they will live there for 400 years and then after that time I will bring them back into this land and I will settle them in this land and they will live here forever. And uh, that generation that came out of Egypt with Moses, they were, in, they were in Egypt their entire life. I mean, these people had grown up in slavery. They had known nothing but slavery. All they understood was slavery. And our message today is, are you living with a slave mentality? Because the truth is, is what we grow up in can often grow up in us. The way we have tended to think from the time we're little, those patterns of thinking and believing can become embedded into our mental capacity. And, and really, the, the greatest enemy that you and I face regarding fulfilling the purposes and plans of God for our lives is really not the devil because Jesus has defeated the devil. We have authority over the devil. Je P Peter said, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen? The biggest enemy we have is ourselves. And the biggest enemy we have in ourselves is that thing right between your ears. It's your brain. It's your thought life. It's the way you think. Uh, the, the most vital aspect of the Christian life after we become a believer is... Renewing our thinking, renewing our mind. And there's four major areas that the believer has to have their mind renewed in. Number one, the way we see God. Because our, our view of God outside of Christ is wrong. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, my ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. And he's speaking to the evil. He says, my ways are not your ways, nor are my thoughts your thoughts. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my way, uh, thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. So the message to the the, the, the unrepentant is turn and begin to follow my ways. That's what the word repent means. It means to do a complete about face, go in a complete different direction, not only physically, but attitude-wise, belief-wise, changing the way we think, changing the way we believe. So first and foremost, we must change the way we see God. We must, become, we must get a biblical view of God. We must, and, and we have to come to the, and that really depends on where we're at before we come to Christian because, you know, I've known a lot of Christians that have been raised in a very legalistic sort of faith. Many times people that are delivered from cults that are very controlling, if they don't, you know, if they don't get their mind remade, that will affect their relationship with God when they come to Christ. And oftentimes as well, people, if you're raised in a very legalistic type of faith, that, that God is just, you always think that God's against you. God's, God's your enemy. Why, I don't know why the Lord's holding out on me. I don't know why the Lord won't heal me. I don't know why the Lord's doing this. We have to change our capacity to realize that God's not your problem. God's your answer. Amen. God is for you. He's not against you. He's with you. So we have to change our thought pattern as to how we see God. We also have to change the way we see ourselves. A lot of Christians have a very, very low self-worth. They don't realize that God loves them. They have a hard time accepting the love of God because they don't love themselves. Jesus said if you are to, that you're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And have you ever noticed this, that bitter and mean people are bitter and mean with themselves? Hurting people hurt other people. It's just the way it is. And so we have to change and become aware of who we are in Jesus Christ. And now we're a different person than what we used to be. And, and God has delivered us from who we used to be. The old person we were before Christ, that man is dead and buried. And we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old life is gone, a new life has come. Then we have to change the way we see other people, right? We need to see them through the eyes of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, we're even to love our enemies. We're to pray for those who do us wrong. 
We're to love other people. We're to bless and not curse. That's a challenging scripture, right? Yeah. And then finally, we're to change the way we see our circumstances. Because God doesn't see our circumstances the way we see our circumstances. You know, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. So we may see everything around us as impossible, impossible, impossible. God says possible, possible, possible. God says the things that are temporary can be changed overnight. The things that you cannot see, they will never change. God is the same. He does not change. But the things we are facing in our lives can be changed. Our circumstances can change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. So we have to have biblical belief system and have our minds remain so that we see that no matter what we're facing in life, God can change that situation. God can turn it around if we will learn how to cooperate with God. So this generation, though, they had grown up in slavery. They had a slave mentality. It was very evident. Because when you're a slave, think about the, compa- you know, the idea of slavery is you don't have any autonomy whatsoever. You don't know when. You, your masters basically rule your life. You're like a, you know, like a cow, like a, a cattle, a farm animal working for your master. And so when you are raised in a slave situation like these Hebrews were, you're going to think like a slave. But when you come out of slavery, what has to happen? Well, that slave mentality has to be broken off of you. And the same thing is true. I like to compare this to our relationship with Christ. Before we know Jesus Christ, we're a slave. We're a slave to sin. We're a slave to darkness. We're a slave to the devil. We're a slave to the the darkness and age around us. We're a slave to the way of thinking of this age. But when we come out of the kingdom of darkness and are delivered into the kingdom of God's dear son through the blood and veil of Jesus Christ, we are no longer slaves, but we are free. Those who the Son sets free are free indeed. And once we are free, we need to recognize and realize and begin to walk in that freedom. We can't put our hands to the plow and keep looking back. And one of the reasons a lot of times God's people aren't free is their, their lives, although they're in Christ, their mind is still set back here. Their mindset is like the old man. They're full of darkness and depression and gloom and doom, and they do not realize that I have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, there's an old saying, the prison door is open, why are you still inside? Amen? The prison door is open. It's time to come on out and breathe the free air. You know, Lazarus was in the tomb. Jesus had come forth, and they, Lazarus came forth. And if you think how they bound people back in those days, they wrapped them like a mummy because the, the Hebrews had learned embalming from the Egyptians when they were in Egypt, and they still embalmed people. And so the man was... God's power, I believe, carried Lazarus out of that tomb and set him on his feet. And then Jesus said, loose him and let him go. So you might be like Lazarus. You've been raised from the dead. You've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness, but you still are maybe wearing grave clothes. It's time to get rid of the grave clothes. It's time to get rid of who you used to be because who you used to be was crucified with Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Who you used to be was buried and laid in a tomb. And the Bible declares, reckon or consider or account the old man dead. Amen. So that man is crucified. I am crucified with Christ, Paul said. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Amen. Praise be to God. Well, Ephesians chapter 4, if you turn over there with me this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Paul, by the Spirit of God, and if you look at Ephesians chapter 4 and you compare this with Romans chapter 12, uh, there's a lot of parallelism here in these two teachings. But in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul speaks about the spirit of the mind. And he says in verse 22, he's speaking to these believers, that you put off concerning your former conduct of the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So Paul is admonishing these believers at Ephesus to put off the old man. What does that mean? Put off the way you used to think. Put off the way you used to live. Put this old man off. Get rid of him. Put him to death. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So if you're going to walk in liberty, if we're going to walk in the freedom we have in Jesus Christ, 
then this is so essential. We have to put on the new man. We have to put on the new way of thinking. We have to change and allow God's word to change how we think. The Amplified says it this way, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. Let our minds be remade. Let our minds be changed. Our minds have to be changed. We have to put on this new way of thinking, this new way of seeing the world. Now, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, that the weapons that we fight with, the weapons of our warfare, are not natural. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. A stronghold represents a fortress, something that is a, a fortress, a physical fortress. Now, in this context, it's a, a mental fortress. Pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, we talk about strongholds in people's lives, that people have strongholds, and those strongholds must be torn down. A stronghold is a pattern or way of believing and thinking that holds us in captivity. That's what it is. That's second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. The weapons of our warfare are not natural, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, in context of what Paul is actually saying there, contextually, because I want to make sure we have it in context, first of all, Paul is talking about the word of God, the power that we fight with, the Holy Spirit power, and the weapons God has given us have the ability to pull down opposition to the kingdom of God, opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when people raise up opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, the weapons we're fighting with, you can't physically make people believe in Jesus Christ. But we fight with spiritual weapons by the power of the Holy Spirit that is able to supersede the power of the enemy and, and break the bondages off of people's minds and hearts. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide our soul and spirit, joints and marrow, very thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God has the power to pierce through the strength of reasoning that people erect against God's power and break that. I, I, I like to talk about apologetics a lot, and by apologetics we mean a, a defense for what we believe. Peter said, be ready to give an answer to those who ask you of the hope that's in you. So thank God we have men and women of God that have been raised up in this hour to really give us great arguments, great reasoning for our faith. And I think there's a biblical, definitely a biblical um, precedent for raising arguments for what we believe. Paul, Paul disputed with the, the, the philosophers on Mars Hill, and then later he disputed with Felix. So, so Paul was a great example of a first century apologist um, but in recent years, because of modern atheism and opposition to the gospel that we've seen, uh, God has raised up a number of people like William Lane Craig, Frank Turek. Um, those are the two that come. A number of other ones that are really good. They don't come to my mind right off, off my mind. But I love, I love studying apologists and giving us ready arguments because we need to know why we believe what we believe. And we need, you know, the Bible is... God didn't say be, re, be transformed by the removal of your mind. He said be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we should be thinking people. And we should have ready defenses for what we believe. And really one of the reasons young people, especially today, when they go off to universities and colleges, their faith is so easily eroded is because they really haven't, formulated a good defense for what they believe. They haven't really thought these things through. Like, why do I believe? Well, that's what my pastor said, or that's what my mom and dad said. And then, of course, when they hear an argument that is well-positioned, they don't know how to answer that argument, and they just cast away their faith in Christ. But there's logical, reasonable arguments for why we believe what we believe. However, those arguments in and of themselves will never convince somebody. Well, I wouldn't say never they do convince people, but they will, they will, they in of themselves are not adequate because they're still intellectual. So what we need to realize is you can give lost people who are skeptics and hard-hearted and unbelief all the reasonable arguments in the world, but if they are in rebellion, that will not set them free. 
That's where we just need to trust in the power of the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed is what the centurion said. We just need to speak the word of God. When people raise a defense against the gospel and we've exhausted the arguments against Christ and we've given them a reasonable argument for the faith and if they do not receive it, then we just trust and we speak the word of God and whether they accept it or not, we believe the word of God will go into the soil of their heart like a sharp sword and pierce through the hardness of their hearts and bring them to the foot of the cross. We have to trust in the power of the word of God. Jerry Seville used to talk about when he went out witnessing, he always tried to get on the streets. He'd always try to get some scripture into somebody, always sharing the word of God because it's the word of God that is power. And so he would always try to put the name of Jesus out there or a scripture verse. And I've shared this before. He talks about this man who he met on the street one day and the man, you know, he said, you know, I want to make sure that when you, you know how to receive Christ as your Savior, and he quoted Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And he said to God, so if you come to the point in your life, and he said, I know you don't want to, and the guy said, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in any of this stuff you tell me. He was a very strong skeptic. And uh, Jerry Seville said, well, just hypothetically, if the day would come and you'd need to call upon Jesus, how would you do it? And the guy, oh, I suppose I'd say what you do, you know, whatever that was. And, well, Jerry Seville said, you know, I put the word of God out there and I have faith in the word of God. <clears throat> and he said, I learned in the early stages of street evangelism, I always go back to the area I'd been before because oftentimes I'd meet the same people and I'd want to follow up and share some more of the word with them if possible. And he said, I was back in that place, and he said, all of a sudden, I see this guy coming down the street. This was the next night, and the guy's making a beeline for me. He just, you know, he's thinking, uh-oh, here we go. And the guy's making a beeline. He gets up to him, and he says, I've been looking for you for an hour. And he said, that stuff you said to me last night, I couldn't sleep at all last night. I was up all night long thinking about what you said. Well, the guy ended up surrendering his life to Christ. Because the word of God went into his heart, and it bothered him. It convicted him. It brought conviction. See, that's the power of the word of God. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a ready defense. And so Paul is saying here the weapons we fight with are not natural weapons. They're spiritual weapons. That's why Jesus, remember Jesus said to his disciples, when they bring you before magistrates, don't prepare. Don't think about what you're going to say on that day, for the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. And that's, that's powerful. And uh, so glory to God. We need to have our confidence and faith in Jesus Christ. And so when we're talking about our minds... We're talking about these slave mentalities. We're talking about these bondages. The bondages people fall prey to are lies and deceit of the devil. Because the devil's a liar. Everything he says is a lie. And one of the things we learn as we grow in our faith with Jesus Christ is how to discern what is true from what is false. What is God's word from what is the lies of the enemy. You know, the truth is the devil is a good liar. He's a very good liar. But Jesus said to the Pharisees of his day, he said, you're of your father, the devil. Because he was a liar and you're just like him. So people that lie all the time, and we live in a world that's full of lies, right? I don't know about you, but whenever elections come around, I just want to throw up because it's just lie after lie after lie after lie. Every advertisement, it's half-truths and almost all lies. It's lies upon lies. It's just the hour of liars, <laughs> and um, it's so exasperating, but we shouldn't expect any different. They're of their father, the devil, and the devil's a liar, and his children act like him. So one of the characteristics of people who don't know Christ is they're liars. Now, when we become a believer, what did Paul say to the church at Ephesus? He said, put away lying. Speak the truth with your neighbor. Amen? Paul, in Ephesians chapter 4, if you go on and read, he's, he's given these believers a, a kind of a rundown of behavior that Christians should practice, you know, like doing good to others, uh, speaking well of your brothers. So we see a lot of this admonition in the Word of God. But obviously, if we're going to break free from past belief systems that are holding us in bondage after we become a believer, or even if we're not a believer then our minds are going to have to be changed. We're going to have to allow the Holy Spirit by the power of the Word of God to begin to change how we think. 
And a, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I gave a message at the gathering about how that I believe that pastors and Christians need to stand up and speak up. We need to speak about the issues of the day. And one of the reasons I said that a lot of pastors and Christians are not speaking up is because they're not living by a biblical worldview. And by a biblical worldview, what we mean, a worldview is self-explanatory. It's a view by which we see the world around us. And a biblical worldview means, essentially, that the scriptures and the authority of scriptures govern our thought life and they govern our behaviors. And so everything that we do should be governed by a biblical worldview. In other words, the music we listen to, the movies we watch, the people we hang out with, the way we talk, the way we behave, the way we make decisions should be governed by the dictates and edicts of Scripture, right? Because we're not our own. Jesus said, you are bought with a price. We are bought with a price. Jesus himself said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I tell you to do? So if Jesus is our Lord, that means he has some say over our lives. That means we have to surrender our choices to him. And sometimes he'll tell us things that we don't really want to hear. He might say, I want you to stop doing that. It's hindering your walk with Christ. You know, Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but they're not all beneficial. There are things that you can do that aren't necessarily sinful, but they're not going to help you spiritually either, right? And Paul said, I will not be bound or brought under dominion of anything. So anything that we can't live without then we have to ask ourselves a question, how much control does this have over our life? And again, it may not necessarily be that it's sinful in of itself, but anything that slows us down, anything that gets in our way, anything that we can't just walk away from at any moment, it can become an inordinate affection, it can become a form of idolatry in our life where we love it more than we love God, or it can just become something the enemy can use as an inroad into our life to keep us really from being fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. And these are all things that the enemy, you have to remember that there's, there's God, there's us, and then there's the enemy. So every voice that comes into our head is not our voice. Every word, every thought we think is not our thoughts. And they're not all the thoughts of God. So we have to recognize that the, the enemy can put thought into your mind. And this is why it's important we learn what we feed on. It, we learn how to feed ourselves spiritually. You know, this is the issue. If you're going to grow as a Christian, as a believer, you're going to have to begin putting the Word of God into you. Now, I love what Dr. Lee talked about. If you read seven chapters of the New Testament every day with every, was it every month, every, how many days was it again? Nine chapters, not seven, nine, sorry. Every day if you read nine chapters of the New Testament, you'll read through the New Testament, I think, once a month. That's pretty powerful. Because just reading the Word of God without even studying it will change you. Because the Word of God is life. It's life to us. And that's what the word says. It is life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 20, 22. My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear into my sayings. Don't let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart for their life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. So this is the bottom line. If you're not putting the word of God in you, the Holy Spirit is not, does not have anything in you to work with. Because the Holy Spirit bears witness with the truth that is in you. Now, most of you have probably forgotten more scriptures and more Bible than many people all over the world have ever heard. Because I preach a lot of scripture when I preach. And you've been in a church, and if you've been in this church for any time, and I'm not bragging on us, but it's simply true. We give you a lot of scripture. And living in the nation and being a believer in America, you've heard a lot of sermons. You've heard a lot of the word. So the truth is, we've heard a lot. But just because we've heard it doesn't mean we're walking in it. So we need to put the word of God in us. We need to be people who hear the word of God. Now, I realize that a lot of Christians, a lot of Americans are not really good readers. And you may not be a good reader. But if you're not a good reader, then start listening to the word on audio. Or start listening 
to, to, you know, because you can listen to the Word of God in numerous ways today through apps and through YouTube and all sorts of ways. So we somehow must find a way to get the Word in us. And one of the things I've found over the years, not the reading of the Word is so important, and that's true, as Dr. Lee admonished us. <clears throat> but the truth is also is meditating upon the Word of God. David said, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. <clears throat> so if you're having an issue in a particular area in your life, you know, if you're having financial struggles in your life, you probably don't need to meditate at that moment maybe on healing scriptures. Maybe you need to, heal, maybe you need to meditate upon scriptures that have to do with stewardship. Because one of the reasons some people have, bad, have financial issues sometimes is they're just not good stewards. They waste money. They spend money impulsively. They go out and buy things they should not buy. And in America, we're, we're really fall prey to that at times where we, we are led by our emotions to go do something and spend money. And believe me, I have fallen prey to that a number of times in my life. I'm much better today because I finally grew up a little bit. You know, I, I have an excuse because the male, you know, we, our brains don't grow into our bodies until we're at least 25. I think most men, it's about 55. Uh, we finally get there. Amen. But the, the truth is, we have to reach a level of maturity. And there's two ways you get mature, by hard knocks or learning from other people. And I'd rather learn from other people's mistakes and learn from my own mistakes. Because as the saying goes, the school of experience is a good teacher, but the tuition is really high. So, so I'd rather avoid the tuition and go on somebody else's dime, kind of like our government today. Amen. So, uh, but the truth is, we have to get the Word of God in us. We have to get the Word of God in us. And so if you're dealing with something in your life right now, those are the scriptures you need to be hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. You need to listen to them over and over and over. Also, I admonish you, get, get sermons, and I've mentioned this before, of people that are feeding you in a particular area. Maybe, maybe you just don't, aren't walking in faith. You don't know what faith is. You don't know how to apply faith to your life. You need to hear words of faith. You need to hear messages that are really building you up in that particular area. If you need faith for healing, then you need to hear messages about healing. You need to meditate on scriptures on healing. Hide my, thy word in my heart because thy word, it's life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. The word of God itself is life to you. The word of God itself will rejuvenate your youth. The Bible says in Psalm uh, 3, I think it is, he satisfies my desires with good things, so my youth is renewed like the eagles. I love that scripture. You know, people all the time say, you know, you don't look your age. You, you don't even act your age. But, uh, <laughs> but you don't look your age. And the reason I don't look my age is I come from good stock, but the other thing is I believe that scripture. He satisfies my desires with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, uh, so I heard somebody say the other day, I, I started getting mad because I started seeing all these old people and they acted old. And then he said, I realized they graduated with me. So, uh, <laughs> but the truth is the word of God will give you life. The word of God will give you health. The word of God will do, God through his word can do anything in your life you need him to do if you get his word in you. Remember what, what the writer to the Hebrews says. Remember what Numbers talks about, that first generation. They came out of Egypt. They had a slave mentality. Every time they faced a difficulty, they wanted to go back to pig slop. They wanted to return to their old lifestyle. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Why? Because Egypt was still in them. The thought life, the patterns of Egypt were still in their DNA. They could not escape it. It just wasn't there. They would not trust God. And it says there was an evil heart in that generation of unbelief and turning from the living God. They refused to believe God. They refused to trust God. And every one of them, over 20 years old, died in the wilderness. They didn't inherit the blessing, even though it was available to them. And the same thing is true today. See, even though we are in Jesus Christ, even though we've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, even though we have, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, all the promises of God are in Christ, are yes and amen to the glory of God the Father. But we still have an enemy. We still live in a fallen world. This world and everything in this world is passing away. And it's diametrically opposed to the kingdom of God. It's built into the system. So if we're going to walk in freedom and liberty and the promises and provision and goodness of God... We're going to have to fight for it. It doesn't just come to you automatically. 
because the enemy of your souls wants to keep you from living in victory. And not only the enemy of your souls, but your thought patterns, your way of believing, your way of thinking, your way of seeing yourself and seeing the world. And so many believers have just been taught bad theology. They've been taught bad Bible. They just don't know what the word of actually says. They believe a lot of things that aren't even biblical. I remember talking to this guy years ago, and I've heard this numerous times, and, and he said to me, you know, I believe if the Lord wants it to happen, it will just happen. There's a lot of Christians that think that way. I pray it's not you. But if it is, just say, oh my. Um, but that is not the way the kingdom of God works. It's not just if the Lord wants it to happen, it'll happen because God is sovereign. No, we have to take hold of God. Think about the woman with the issue of blood. Think about blind Bartimaeus. Think about the man who they let down through the roof. His friends let him down through the roof in front of Jesus in the house, and he healed him and set him free. If those people had been like most modern-day Christians, you'd never have read about them because they'd still be at home. So if you want God and you want the things of God and you want the liberty of God, you have to go after it. And it isn't that God is holding out on us. It isn't that God doesn't want to bless his people. But God is not moved by people's needs. God will not be controlled by circumstances and people's needs. You see this in the life and ministry of Jesus. Oftentimes people are like, we got to do something right now. And Jesus said, hey, let's chill. Let's take a chill pill. He's in the boat having a nap. His disciples say, Master, don't you care that we, we drown? We're going to drown. We're going to swamp. And Jesus woke up and he didn't say, oh man, why didn't you wake me up earlier? I, yeah, I didn't know there was a storm going on. No, he says, oh you of little faith. And he rebukes the storm and the sea's calm. And oftentimes Jesus ministered that way. He, he refused to be led by people's emotional tirades. You know, the, the Pharisees, they come and said, you know, by whose authority do you do these things? And Jesus said, I'll ask you a question. By, by the baptism of John, is it of God or is it of man? And the Pharisees, oh, okay, if we, if we say it's of man, you know, if we say it's of, of, of man, then uh, these people are going to stone us because John was, they f figured he was a prophet. And finally they come back, we can't tell. And Jesus said, well, I'm not telling you either. <laughs> and I love Jesus. He's just so cool. Because he just would not let people pull on him. He would not let people dictate the terms of engagement. Even Peter, his right-hand man, Peter. Who do men say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus goes on this long dissertation about how the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, Son of God is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, and they're going to kill him, and after third, three days he'll be raised again from the dead. And Peter, thinking like a natural person, goes, Lord, this will never happen. He rebukes Jesus. And Jesus finally says, Get thou behind me, Satan, for you are of the devil. In other words, you're trying to lead me and cause me to stumble. I'm not having any of that. Jesus set his face like flint. And see, if you're going to walk in liberty, you're going to have to be a fighter. You cannot just be passive in your faith. You cannot just go, well, you know, if the Lord wants it to happen, one of these days it'll happen. You will sit there in your darkness and you will die that way. That's simply a fact. So, well, doesn't the Lord care? Yeah, the Lord does care. But the Lord, in his, the way he has laid this out is we must walk in faith. We must take hold of God. We must take hold of the hem of his garment. We must pursue after the Lord. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Isn't that what Jesus himself said? He didn't say blessed are they that lay around the house wanting righteousness and hunger to come on. He said blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. So it has to do with the way we see ourselves, the way we see the world. So we're going to wrap this up this morning. I want to share with you a number of characteristics of the children of Israel regarding a slave mentality because I think it's very evident in, in the way they reacted. This first generation, and I really wish we could spend more time today just camping here looking at this generation because they're such a great example to us of walking in victory. First of all, they were slaves a long time. You realize that the longer you walk in something, the harder it is to get out of it. The old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's easier to stay healed than it is to get healed. 
Right? Isn't that true? So stand against sickness. Don't give it a place in your life. Take preventative action. Be preventative. In other words, hey, it's the flu season. That means it shall not come nigh my dwelling. I'm standing against flu. I'm standing against viruses. I'm standing against the report of man. I will not receive that in Jesus' name. Be preemptive. Don't be reactive. Often we're reactive instead of preemptive. And we need to stand and build a bulwark against darkness by faith. The Lord says, the angel of the Lord encamps about us and delivers us. We need to erect a wall of defense in advance against the darkness of the enemy. If you hide the word of God in your heart and you build a strong defense by the word of God being in you in abundance, then what happens when you come into situations instead of, oh me, oh my, oh you, whatever shall I do, out comes the word of God. Let me give you a simple example of this. It seems really ridiculous. Oh, because I have hit deer before with my car. But over the years, the other night I was coming home from Bible study down in Cornell and I popped over a hill, probably going faster than I should have been, uh, which is an amazing thing. I know you would say, Pastor Tim, you were never going faster than you should have been. But I popped over this hill and there was a bridge and all of a sudden there was deer on the bridge and as I was going over this bridge, this buck just come flying out of the bridge and out of my mouth said, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And that buck turned like this and he came right up to my car and ran along my car. And that's happened a number of times. But, you know, I didn't say, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I'm going to get hit by that deer. The deer's going to, Jesus came out of, and it was just reactive. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And thank God it wasn't some swear word or something like that. Because, see, I put that word in me. It was just reactive. See, if you put the word in you, you will react with the word. It'll come out of your heart. It'll come out of your mouth. And often, when we're dealing with stuff, and by no means, I mean, I stand here, so, oh, yes, Pastor, you're so spiritual. Yes, yeah, so, oh, oh, if we could only be like you. I do want to be an example of faith. But listen, I have a brain as well as you do. <laughs> and sometimes... You know, uh, your reasoning can get in the way of your faith. And so if, if you start talking about your problems all the time, and you're giving voice to those problems all the time, those problems will rise up and become an enemy against you. And this is part of the problem with a lot of people. They're always talking about their problems. You know, if I have problems... Usually the only person I will often talk to about that is people that I have leaders in my church as far as very close people or this woman right here. We're the only ones that usually talk about our problems. We rarely share our problems with other people. And it's not that we're so proud or we're too proud to share our problems, but this is what I found. You talk about your problems, your problems grow. They get big. I think there's a Veggie Tale video about that. Was it the, the fibber or something? The fib gets big. The big lie, I think it's like that. And it just gets big because they talk about it. The more you talk about things and your problems, your problems get fire and they get fuel. Now, that isn't to say you don't need godly counsel. The Bible says in the counsel of, with wise counsel make war. In other words, you need other people to be able to share things with. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about I've got a problem and this is the problem and let me share my problem. And boy, it's a problem, a problem, a problem. And I, I'm telling you, this is a slave mentality. You have to break that off of you. You have to start talking the answer instead of the problem. This is the way a lot of people pray. They pray the problem. They're, oh, Lord, I got this problem. And, Lord, don't you know this problem and this problem? It's okay to voice the problem, but you better have an answer behind that. And Lord, you are with me. David said, an enemy is encamped against me, but through my God I can run through a troop and jump over a wall. David always ended his prayer of sorrow with a prayer of victory. See, we got to get our eyes off of ourselves and off of our problems and on to the answer who is God. And that was the problem with this generation. They've been in slavery so long that all they ever thought like was the problem in front of me. They could not imagine that this God who delivered them out of darkness by his mighty outstretched arm parted the Red Sea, caused the water to pile up, caused them to go through on dry ground, caused the entire Egyptian um, charioteers to be drowned in the ocean, and then provided 
manna and quail and all of this provision supernaturally. Forty years. Do you know that it was 40 years? There was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Forty years the presence of God was with them. Forty years. For all those years, manna came out of heaven. It wasn't until they went into the promised land and the waters end, came back into their place on the Jordan River, again, supernaturally. It wasn't until then that the manna stopped. God had provided for them. But every time they came to a test, every time they came to a test, oh, what are we going to do? Oh, we better go back to Egypt. We better go back to the government. We better go see if Kamala Harris will give us some money. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, oh, I could, I just love to meddle right now, man. I tell you. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? All these politicians always want to buy your vote. <laughs> I care about the middle class. We're going to cut, cut your tap. You know, oh, Kamala, we've been here for the last four years. <laughs> Outside of Washington, there is a place called the middle class. Amen. <laughs> oh, anyhow, I'm getting... I'll, I'll just leave that alone. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But they, had, they were in bondage a long time. And when you've been in bondage a long time, you've been in the thought pattern a long time, you have to be more vigilant. You have to really get after it to break down those strongholds. You know, what you get raised in gets raised in you. And if you get the right thing raised in you, and this is why the Bible says, train up a child the way he should go, and after he's old, he'll not depart from it. You know, even if your kids are looking like the devil himself and in rebellion, don't give in to that. Say, you will serve the Lord whether you want to or not. You can, be, you can be happy or miserable. You might as well be happy now instead of be miserable until you return back to the Lord because you are going to be miserable until you turn back. And I'll pray that you're miserable. I'll pray the devil doesn't kill you, but I'll pray God will make you miserable. Amen? So why not be happy and, uh, you know, if you're happy and you know it, shout amen right now. Amen. So, <laughs> so they, were in, they were in misery and bondage a long time. Um, secondly, the children of Israel, they focused their attention on their problem, and I just talked about this instead of their answer. They were all about the giants in the land. Those spies that went in to spy out the land, 10 of them came back, and all they could talk about was how big the giants were. All they could talk about is how, much, how big the enemy was. Only two people out of the 12, Joshua and Caleb, had a different spirit, and they talked about how big God was. They talked about if God is for us, who can be against us? Hey, their defense has departed from us. Let's, from them, let's go in and take the land. God's with us. Let's go do it. Let's go take the land. All the others, no, we can't do that. That's impossible. We can't, we can't do something like that because they were focused on their problems and this is the way we can become we can be focused on a problem focused on a problem and you know what I found uh, the truth is the enemy will bring problems and trouble into your life in attacks to wear you out he'll wear you out emotionally he'll wear you out spiritually unless you put him to flight and I, I don't know I've been in this situation before a number of times where you know, my mind is being afflicted by fear and all sorts of things are going on. And what I found is there comes a point where you just have to say, this is enough. And you stand up and you begin declaring the word of God. You say, devil, you will shut your mouth. You will be silent. Greater is he. And you start quoting scripture. You start quoting the word. You don't have to know scripture in you know, where the verse is found in the Bible. You just need to know the verse. And you start proclaiming and putting the enemy to flight. You take the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith wherewith you should be able to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one, and you go to battle with that devil. You put him to flight. You let him know the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. See, the devil's a bully. He's an antagonist. And he'll bully you, and he'll bully you, and he'll bully you until you stand up to him and you fight against him and put him to flight. Because he is already defeated in your life. You just need to remind him of that. You need to remind him the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. And he will listen to you when you talk to him. Amen. Number three, the children of Israel were ready and willing to leave Egypt when all was well, but they were just as willing and ready to go back to Egypt when all was bad. You don't want to be a yo-yo Christian. You don't want to be a, you know, a, a, a Christian that's up one minute and down the next, and up and down, and up and down, and up and down. And we live in a world of emotionalism. People are so emotional about everything today. Our emotions are great, but they can be your undoing as well. You know, one day you could feel great, the next day you feel bad. I feel depressed, I feel happy. David said, you know, why are you so downcast within me, O oh my soul? 
Smith Wigglesworth used to say, I don't ask Smith Wigglesworth how he feels, I tell him how he feels. <laughs> I love that. Stop asking yourself, I'm so, what's really the issue here is so many times we're too self-absorbed. We're too, I heard a dear friend of mine, Pastor Tim Warner, say one time, if, if, if most of your thought process is thinking about you and your life, you're too self, self-absorbed. The Bible says, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. One translation says, let heaven fill your thoughts. Don't just think about things down here. So if you're always thinking about you, yourself, and I, me, myself, and I, if you're always thinking about you, then you're, you're self-absorbed. And we live in a very self-absorbed society. We need to be others-absorbed. One of the ways out of our difficulties is go help other people. Go help other people. Go minister to somebody else. Go get your eyes on other people's problems instead of just your problems. And one of the things you'll find as you're helping other people, it won't necessarily mean your problems will go away. Sometimes it will, but it'll bring perspective to your life because you're not just thinking about yourself all the time. Amen? So praise be to God. Uh, Number four, the children of Israel had an excuse as to why they could not possess the land. We can't go up and possess the land. Those guys are bigger than us. This problem's too much. I don't have the money. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, kind of, they were kind of like the whiner generation. You ever have kids that they whine all the time? I can't do that. I'm so bored. My parents, you know, I've come from old school, and your mom and dad used to say, if you keep whining, I'll give you something to whine about. <laughs> uh, I think that's good advice. I think that's really good advice. We should apply that today. It would stop a lot of the whining. Amen. And God doesn't like whiners either. A whole bunch of people died because they complained. They were whiners and complainers. Okay, I'll show you what complaining is about. You know, uh, so we don't want to be whiners and complainers. We want to thank the Lord for what we do have. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul was strapped to a Philippian, uh, Philippian jail when he said rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And uh, the sewage was running through the prison. Uh, Rick Renner said he'd been in that prison where Paul was jailed. He said, even to this day, you can still smell the sewage that is embedded into the bricks in that prison. So I can imagine what it must have been like in those days. Probably burned your eyes. It was so strong. So anyhow, number five, the children of Israel liked to complain about their problems. They were ungrateful. We have to be grateful for what God is doing in our life. One of the characteristics of faith is thanksgiving if you're not thankful then you're not in faith because when we ask God to do something in our life when we're seeking God for an answer to our issues then our posturing must change from asking to thanking Lord I thank you that we have the victory Lord I thank you even though it looks bad I rejoice in you and I thank you that if God be for me who can be against me Father I thank you that you're turning this whole thing around Father I thank you that you've done this I thank you that you've heard my prayers I bless you and praise you for victory we thank God that he's answered our prayers we give him glory and thanksgiving number six the children of Israel knew God's acts but they didn't know his ways You know, one of the issues you will learn as you begin to put the word of God in your heart and walk with him and grow in your faith with him is you begin to learn the character of God. You begin to realize that you don't have to ask God every single thing because you know what God would do there. You know if it, you know the heart of God. You know, for instance, if somebody needs to be healed, I don't have to fast and pray and seek the face of the Lord to find out whether or not he wants him to be healed. I don't have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm really not sure if healing is your will, but I pray that you would reveal to me whether or not you want this to take place. I don't have to do that because God is good and he is revealed. If I just think of the Lord Jesus Christ, all they that came to him, he in no wise cast out. Do you ever see in the life and ministry of Jesus somebody coming to him for something? He goes, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, it's not the will of the Lord. The Lord always, he would always bless people. He had compassion on people. And so, they knew God's acts, but they didn't know his ways. The Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 7, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. When you know the ways of God, you'll not only know what God did, but you'll know why God did it. You know the heart of God. And the heart of God is the heart of a father. And Psalm 103 is one of my favorite psalms. 
And it talks about the heart of a compassionate father. God has not dealt with us according to our sins. He's not rewarded us according to our iniquities. As a father pities his son, so the Lord pities those who are his own. He remembers our frame that we're but dust. God's compassionate. Aren't you glad he's compassionate? And finally, number seven, the children of Israel would not grow closer to God because they knew it meant leaving what they were comfortable with. This was their only way of lasting freedom. So you have to ask yourself this question, and it's a tough question. It sounds a bit non-compassionate, but it's really not. And that is, do you really want to be free? Do you really want to be free? And how badly do you want to be free? Because if you want to be free, then you're going to need to do whatever you need to do to get free. And I know this is not a popular statement in this society today because what we always want is to take everybody by the hand and we want to be compassionate to people. But sometimes sympathy is not what you need. You need to change. You need to do whatever you need to do to change. And if you can't change by yourself, then you do need people who can help you change. And that means they might have to speak some very difficult things to you that you don't really want to hear. Because often the issue is not out here, the issue's in here. It's the way we're thinking. It's the way we're believing. It's the way we're posturing ourselves. We can be in unbelief and not even know we're in unbelief. It happens all the time. People think, I'm believing God. Yeah, they prayed for me, I'm believing God. But they're not in belief because if you start listening to how people talk, it's like, that's not believing God. You believe in circumstances. So we need people around us. We need people around us to speak the truth in love. We need to be able to make adjustments. Because you can be believing God, and you think you're believing God, and all of a sudden you hear a word and go, wow, I haven't been doing that. I mean, I've been preaching faith my whole life since I've been a believer. And I'll listen to a word on faith and go, you know what, I haven't been doing that. I, I've been neglecting that. And it's like, all you need to do then is make an adjustment. It's like a course correction. And you're back like, man, praise be to God. Yeah, we always, always, constantly need to make course corrections. No matter how long you've been lock, walking with the Lord, we need to be led by the Holy Ghost. So we want to get to the point in our life, spiritually speaking, by prayer and spending time with God and putting his word in our hearts, hiding his word in our heart, hearing the word, reading the word, speaking the word, meditating upon the word, thinking on the word, speaking the word. We need to get to the point where the slightest nudge of the Holy Spirit and we will make that adjustment. Instead of like a battering ram, the Lord has to knock you over the head with a battering ram before you finally accept it. You know, we don't want to be like the Psalm, the Proverbs that says, I was almost in destruction in the congregation because I was stiff-necked. We don't want to be like that generation. That generation is a great generation. It is written for our admonition because it says, these people always go astray in their hearts. What did that mean? It meant they had an attitude issue. They weren't teachable. They weren't correctable. We always need to be humble and teachable and correctable because none of us have arrived and none of us know everything. And if we're not careful, we can get to the point where we're not teachable, we're not correctable. We can't make adjustments because we're so stuck in our way that, oh my goodness, this would, might, might upset something in my life. But a lot of things in my life over the years, God has corrected and changed the way I see things. Because we're always growing, we're always pressing, we're always, we're, we never get to the point where like, okay, I've, I know everything I could have ever known, and I've grown up, and now I don't need to grow more. The more you grow, the more immature you realize you are. You know, you, you might think you're spiritually mature until you get around somebody that's really spiritually mature. It's like, I feel like a baby. I mean, I've been around men of God and women of God over the years that I, I like, I haven't even gotten a first year here compared to where I see them. And, and we need people like that in our lives. We need people that we look at and go, man, this man is a man of God or a woman of God. Look how spiritual and, and grown up. Now, now, obviously, we don't want to idolize people because I don't care who they are. They still have issues in their lives. So don't, don't idolize people, but admire their faith. Admire their wisdom. Admire and follow after their wisdom that they've walked with God in areas and then we need people around us, you know, like Barnabases, those people that are loyal to you, that they always stand by you. They, they believe in you when you're good and bad and ugly. 
Those are faithful, loyal people. And then we all need Timothys around us. These are people we're pouring our lives in and taking what we've learned and helping them grow as well. But I believe that if you identify with any of these things today that I've brought before you, the children of Israel, don't despair and don't be down on yourself. Just let God begin to make those course corrections. What are some areas of your life that you're hearing like, you know, I, yeah, I find myself whining about things a lot. I'm complaining to the Lord. I'm complaining and murmuring. I'm, I'm really not as thankful as I should be for what God's done in my life. Maybe that's an area you need to really work on. You need to learn how to give thanksgiving. From the rising of the sun to the place that it goes down, the name of the Lord shall be praised. Learn to give thanksgiving to God. Learn to give him thanks. Even when things don't go right, give him thanks. You're not thanking him for the problem, but you're thanking him that you have an answer to the problem. You never thank God for problems. You thank God for solutions. Because God often, God's not the one sending your problem. The devil is. The circumstances are. But you thank God that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. My cup runneth over. Amen? Hallelujah. You're thanking God for the solution. You're not thanking God for the problem. But God has a solution. God has an answer for you. But you have to take hold of him. You have to take hold of the word of God. You have to be vigilant. Oftentimes, the reason Christians are not really walking in victory is because they're just lazy. They're spiritually lazy. They're not physically lazy, but they're just not doing what they need to do. And, and when you're in a really difficult situation, the more urgent your situation is, the more urgent you must be in the word of God. You, you can't just lay back and like, oh, yeah, man, one of these days things will get better. No, you have to put your foot to the metal, man. You have to seek after, the, you have to take hold of God. The woman with the issue of blood, she was desperate. Blind Bartimaeus, he was desperate. The man whose friends let down through the roof, they were desperate. Desperate faith will move the hand of God. And we must take hold of God by faith. And we must take hold of him. And this was part of the issue with this group of people, this generation, is they were very passive and laissez. And every time you turned around, their minds were fixed back on the old way of living. But when we come out of the kingdom of darkness and we put on this new man that is in Christ Jesus, and we put on this new way of thinking, this new way of living, this new way of speaking, this new way of action, we will become Christ-like in our lives. Guaranteed, because if God, God is with you, and you can grow in the understanding and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know, the awesome thing about walking with God in spiritual maturity, while there is a season that we realize the longer you walk in the ways of God, you will and should grow in wisdom and relationship with God. But that's not guaranteed. Because by this I mean, I've known a lot of people that have been Christians a long time, and they're very spiritually immature. Because they've not applied their heart to knowledge. They've not grown up. And then I've known people that haven't been Christians real long. But man, they've gotten after it. They got a hold of God and they're seeking God. Now they still got a lot of growing to do. But you can grow very quickly, spiritually speaking, if you hunger and thirst after God. That's what Paul said to Timothy. He said, let no man despise your youth, but be an example to the flock. That's what the word of God says in Psalm 119. I know more than my elders because I've hidden your word and love thy word. The word of God will make you grow. The word of God will make you change. The word of God will make you free if you'll put it in your heart and apply your heart to it. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you this morning. We praise you for the power of the kingdom of God in our lives. And we thank you that those who the sun sets free are free indeed. Now, if you're here this morning, I'm going to let you go, but if you're here this morning and you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, None of this will do you any good. If you're outside of the kingdom, you'll die without Christ, and God doesn't want that. God wants you to know him. So this morning, before we're dismissed, I want to make sure that we give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Or maybe you are a believer, but you're not really where you need to be. And some of these things have really kind of convicted you, and you need to uh, repent. You, you see, there's some areas, Tim, that I have not really been doing, and I've been in sin about, in unbelief about, in disobedience about, or unteachable about. And if that's you, we want to pray for you this morning. We're going to pray a prayer together. If you are ready to turn your life away from the kingdom of this world, the darkness of this world, and you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and come into the family and the kingdom of God, then God loves you and wants to set you free. Because that's the first step. 
Because if you don't surrender your life to Christ, you have no freedom at all. You're going to be bound in your sin until you die, and that will be even worse. Or if you are a believer and you say, Pastor Tim, I've not been walking in these things, and I want to make that course adjustment today. We're going to pray for you this morning. We're going to pray this together. And then if you have a need in prayer and we haven't prayed for you today, as we dismiss the service, our prayer team members will be up here and they'll pray for you. And uh, the Lord will be glad to meet you where you're at. Maybe it's something you need some counsel in, something you need a little more extensive prayer in. Please come up and we'd love to pray with you. But why don't you stand to your feet this morning? We're going to pray this together. And just, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Heavenly Father, dear God, I confess that I've sinned before you. And I ask your mercy. I want to turn from my sin. And I renounce it. I renounce the devil. I renounce the kingdom of darkness. And I renounce that old man. And I ask your forgiveness and your mercy. Help me to make those adjustments in the way I'm thinking, in the way I'm speaking, and in the way I'm living so that I'm more in alignment with your word, your kingdom, your will. I pray that your will would be done in my life as it is in heaven. Father, this morning, I repent, I turn from my sin, and I receive your forgiveness. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that is washing me, cleansing me, and renewing me. I receive your forgiveness, and I believe that Jesus is my Lord, my Savior. I profess him as Lord. I thank you for his sacrifice. I thank you for his resurrection. And I thank you for new life that is only found through him. So Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, you are my Lord. I will follow you. I will live for you. And I will serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, that's simply a starting spot. It's not the end of the journey. It's the beginning of the journey. If you do need prayer this morning, please come on up and we'd love to pray with you because we want to make sure that you're free. Amen? And uh, let me just pray over you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace and cause his face to shine upon you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Amen.